Hello, and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 31, A Badge of Honor, Flying the geek, uh, Gamer Geek Flag. From Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here tonight. Uh, we start here live Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more off the books after show. This week, we're going to try something new. We're going to swap up the order of everything on the show. A bunch of our segments are going to move around. We're taking our main topic, our usual Ask the Bellhop, our, our big discussion, and we're going to move that up to the front of the show after our audience feedback section. For those of you who enjoy our reviews and weekly look back at the games we played, don't worry, they're still here. It's just going to be after the main topic and any announcements or reviews. That's right. Today, Sean actually has a review of board game stats, and I'm going to be talking about getting some expansions to the table. One for Zolkin and two for Villages of Valeria. Uh, board game arena race for the galaxy update. Some talk on war chest, more Azul stained glass of Sintra, and a medium length game of Dinosaur Island. I know we, my family went all out with the DC deck builder and made another run at the monster box of monsters. So one other change, too. We're going to break out the weekly Gloomhaven recap to its own segment. Uh, this can be found after our main topic, but before we hit Tabletop Gaming Weekly. Now, we aren't cutting anything from the show, just moving it around, and everything you have come to enjoy is still here, just in a different order. After the meat of the main topic, we still have all that review and detail for those that love it. We love interacting with our listeners and viewers. We're here for you, and we want to talk and interact with you. Each week, we're going to highlight some of those discussions. Feedback we've received, comments on our content, gaming discussions we've been part on, and so on. We want to share what people are saying, both positive and negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. And if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media, where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. And I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Up first, Frank J. Zbink commented about f our Finding Yoda segment. I personally like having someone to show how the game works, then I will read the rules. Thanks for the comment, Frank. I, I gotta say I'm the opposite. I want to read it first, then see it working. The one thing I have learned over the years that after a couple plays, go back and reread those rules. It's amazing how many small and sometimes big rules I've missed over the years. There's a reason we like to joke about playing the extreme version of games around here. Now, Brian Thompson on MeWe also wrote about our Finding a Teacher episode. Thanks, Mo. Those are some great suggestions. I have a few games on my shelf that I haven't gotten to the table because some of serious head scratching and YouTube playthroughs just weren't doing it. Thanks, Brian. It happens. Some games, you just need to come at in a particular way for a particular person. I know I learned that with Race for the Galaxy. Now, Nate Parker writes about our WWE Superstar Showdown unboxing video. Dude, WWE Superstar Showdown is a great wrestling game. I've played a number of matches where you think you have it in the bag, and it all turns around on you right at the very end, snatching defeat from the jaws of victory, or vice versa. It is, lim yeah, it is limited with the wrestlers that are in it, but it is still a good game in the box. Also, if you go on BGG, there are a number of fan-made wrestler decks that bring in wrestlers you are familiar with, like Hulk Hogan. Oh, sweet. Uh, thanks for that info, Nate. I still haven't gotten my copy of Superstar Showdown to the table yet, but it sounds like it's going to be worth playing. Now, assuming we dig it, I am going to have to check out that fan stuff on Board Game Geek. I am going to love being able to play 80s wrestlers. I think that'd be fantastic. Now, do they still count as 80s wrestlers if they refuse to retire? Hogan had his last fight in 2015. Uh, fair point, fair point. Uh, I got to say, for the 80s, though, for me, that was the prime time of wrestling. And I don't really care much what they're doing now. I just want to sit down and play a match between the Junkyard Dog and George Animal Steel. I want rules for ring announcers to come in so you can have um, the mouth of the South Jimmy Hart standing outside. I don't know. That To me, the eight, wrestling was 80s. Come on, there used to be a cartoon. You could watch... 
what was it Hulk Hogan and his amazing friends or something? I don't even know what it was called. Well, was Cindy Lauper? Cindy Lauper got involved. Yeah. Yep. Went Cindy Lauper and Weird Al Albano. The, oh, day, man. the days of rock and wrestling. Yes, that's a, is that what it was called? Hulk Hogan's Rock and Wrestling. I think that might have been the title. Yeah, yeah. I think that might have been it. Wow, flashback time. I might have to go on Amazon and see if you can find old seasons of that. Although first, I might try to find a bootleg copy so I can watch one and go, I, okay, you know good. What? YouTube, YouTube probably has them. To be yeah, honest. I probably don't actually want to see <laughs> that again. Yep. I, I'm still surprised that the fashion of wearing uh, elastics in your cheek faded. I don't know. I don't know. You never know. Kind of strange. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, The Lobby. We do welcome the interaction, though. If you are here, feel free to interact. We do check in with The Lobby, as you've just seen multiple times every show. Uh, if you do have a question, feel free to ask it. If you have comments on what we're talking about, please get involved. We're here for you. Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. We're everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Well, the best way to get questions to come to me is through the website. I'm not going to miss them that way, but I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere else on the web. This week, we're talking about flying the gamer geek flag and wearing the tabletop gamer badge with honor. Yeah, times have changed. Talk about the 80s and uh, old school wrestling. Being a gamer back then was anything but cool. Being a gamer meant being an outsider, uh, a geek, a nerd. Well, even those aren't really that bad of terms now. But back then, being a geek and a nerd was bad. Just, it was not cool to like gaming at all. Now, despite that, I've always been one to wear my hobby with pride. Uh, I didn't hide the fact that I was a gamer. I carried my Warhammer rule books with me openly. I had Futhark runes written on my je denim jacket. I paid to import Games Workshop t-shirts from the UK and wore my Skaven shirt downtown Windsor with pride. I was never ashamed to be a gamer. Today, though, being into games doesn't mean you have to be a pariah at all. Far from it. Actually, it might make you one of the cool kids. Now, being into gaming isn't just normal. It's it's neat. It's cool. It's hip. It's the popular thing. I got to admit, that still hasn't quite sunk in yet. I'm still getting used to it. But one of the benefits of this culture change is now it's easier than ever to fly your gamer geek flag. So to be clear, we use the word geek around here pretty freely. We may also drop nerd and other similar mm -hmm. words from time to time. We use them with pride and honor. I'm a nerd and a geek and damn proud of it, despite the less than enjoyable childhood it sometimes meant for me growing up. What we want to talk about today is why today in this modern world, you should fly the flag and give some suggestions on how you can do it. So why fly the flag? So you should never be ashamed of being into the things you love. Part of being a fan of a thing is celebrating that thing and letting the world know you love it. Sports fans have their jerseys and ball caps and other paraphernalia and sports cards. Star Wars fans have, well, nowadays, everything. I've seen Star Wars branded bananas at the local store. I don't know why you would buy a banana with Darth Maul on it, but you can. Uh, for gamers, though, there's no reason not to also celebrate your hobby in the same way. Being proud of your hobby and showing it off is one thing, but really there's an ulterior motive to this, something a little more selfish. The reason I like to fly my gamer flag is to silently signal other gamers. It's a way of letting other hobbyists know that we have something in common. Now this could just lead to a polite nod at each other as we pass on the street, or it could lead to meeting up with an awesome new local gamer, someone you could end up playing games with for years. It might just lead to a lifetime friendship. You see someone wearing a Lanterns t-shirt, you know that person's into hobby board games. Like, Lanterns is a great game, but it's not one I'd call mainstream in any way. You get on the bus and you see someone with a Beholder patch on their backpack, you know you've got an RPG fan in your midst. That woman in the D20 dress, you bet she's rolled some crits before. Gamer merch is such a great conversation starter, an indicator of saying, hey, I'm into this thing. So fly that gamer flag and get out there and meet some new gamers. Now, I personally tend to be a slightly different type of nerd. My flags tend to be more high-end sarcasm, science puns, and tech, but the effect is the same. When someone recognizes some obscure reference on my shirt or gets a sub subtle brainy joke, it makes my day. One of the most common ways to show your love of gaming is by wearing it on your sleeve, literally. 
That's right. T-shirts have always been a big thing with fans. Uh, I don't, if I'm not going to work like a desk job where I got to wear a collared shirt, I'm wearing a t-shirt with something geeky on it. If you see me in Windsor, anywhere out shopping, out for dinner, I'm wearing a t-shirt with something geeky on it. And most of the time nowadays due to being able to the availability of gaming shirts, it's often a gaming related t-shirt. Now, most of my shops, my shops. Wow. This is terrible today. To just improv everything. We'll just throw it out the window. You're going to, this is the, the edit show for Sean. <laughs> <laughs> Most of my shirts come from a few select online shops. Now, Think Geek is number one. They have a ton of awesome geeky shirts. And as the years go on, they are getting more and more directly related to gaming. Like they are the company that has the Dungeons and Dragons license. I own quite a few of their shirts, usually bought during a sale. Because I got to say, their regular prices are a bit high. And man, shipping to Canada from there is terrible. But if you wait for the right deal, they can be worth it. Think Geek's also really good because they offer more than just shirts when it comes to clothing. I do the t-shirt thing, but if you're into hoodies, sweaters, sweatshirts, heck, they do socks and underwear too. Think Geek is really the king of geek merch. Sadly, they are pricey. So now that yeah. they are appearing in some stores... And their appearances at cons are always welcome to take a bite out of that price, even mm -hmm. if it's just to avoid shipping. Yeah, from what I understand, they made a deal with Hot Topic, I think it is, or one or Spencer's Gifts. It's one of those uh, Hot popular Topic, stores Hot in the Topics States. Hot Topics is my understanding. I, I'm not Hot sure Topic now uh, does. I'm not sure if that's in Canada, but definitely in the States. Yeah, as far as I know, Think Geek still doesn't do Canada. So, speaking of something in Canada, though they don't ship from Canada, uh, there's Geeky Goodies from Chris Cormier. I have probably even more shirts from them than I do from Think Geek. Uh, one of my favorite shirts from them is a yellow cube. It's like a yellow resource cube. It says Cube Pusher on it. I love wearing that shirt when I'm going somewhere new. So if I go to a con or I'm going to a new gaming event, because that lets me show up and go, look, I play yellow. I have it on my shirt. I've claimed it. I've got my name on it. That's my color. That way I don't have to get, you know, get screwed up and someone makes me play red and I move the wrong pieces. Um... The other shirt I have from them, it is the shirt that I have met the most people with, is uh, Geeky Goodies Game Designer t-shirt, which is just a bunch of names of game designers on it. The day I wore that to Origins, I got by, stopped by so many people all trying to find their favorite game designer. Oh, is Feld on there? Oh, is whoever, Vaccarino on there? I even had game designers stop me to say, hey, am I on there? And I'm sorry, Ryan, Luca, you're, you're still not there. It's not my fault. Talk to Chris, not me. Don't be mad at me that you're not on my shirt. I didn't put the names there. Well, I think I wore out all my old Think Geek wear and I need a restock. Uh, <laughs> but as luckily my day job lets me wear t-shirts and yeah. encourages all black. So my wardrobe is rather narrow. Uh, <laughs> now, besides Think Geek and Geeky Goodies, there are literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of online t-shirt shops. Um, I just mentioned the two because they're ones I bought from. Now, I know Sean's a big fan of the geeky t-shirts as well. Are there any recommendations you have for t-shirt shops? Uh, so I've gone, uh, had a lot of luck with Teespring uh, and some other various t-shirt shops uh, online. Uh, sadly, however, there's a big problem with copyright infringement at yeah. a lot of these stores. So do, if you are going to go out there and, and hit some of these uh, sort of off-brand, off off-market stores, try and make sure as best you can that you're not mm -hmm. buying knockoff merchandise. It's one thing if it's a pithy phrase or a quote, but if it's graphics or art, uh, try and be sure that the content creator is getting paid for their work. Yeah, it's very true. Um, plus, if you see a piece of art like that, see if the site has a way to report that. Like, I don't, I don't suggest spending your spare time policing the sites, but if it happens to come up, I do that. I see friends of mine art, stuff I see shared on Facebook. Dyson Logos does maps like this style. His stuff gets stolen all the time. Now, he's a personal friend of mine from Ottawa, fantastic mapper who's trying to get by making maps. And every time I see a piece of his art shared or used, especially on shirts and merch, I let him know and I also report it myself. And to be fair, Amazon is actually one of the worst places for this because they don't police their marketplace at all. Uh, you can put up pretty much anything you want on the Amazon marketplace uh, and they, they don't really care, unfortunately. Yeah, that's pretty sad. Amazon's starting to pull the eBay. We're just a venue. We just warehouse this stuff and ship it. So now if you don't like any of the shirts you can see on the, you do see on these sites, you can go make your own. 
Uh, head over to Cafe Press. That's a site that I know many people use, and you just click on Design Your Own at the top. Uh, there's also Arts Cow. Now, I've used Arts Cow a lot for game mats and custom printed cards. I've never used them for shirts, but I do know they do it as well. And of course, if you Google it, there's probably a hundred or a thousand other sites to make your own shirts. And again, I just want to remind everyone, copyright, you know, please yeah. don't use other people's designs for your projects, even if it's just for yourself. Uh, reach out to the creator. They may say, mm -hmm. go ahead and do it. Or they may already have something available that you can, uh, mm -hmm. that you can purchase where they get the funds for their work and be rewarded to encourage their, uh, them to create more content. Yeah, very true. Next up, carry it. Gamer luggage, it's a thing. Yes, it is. Uh, someone once noted when I reviewed the Quiver, it was the most appropriate thing the Tabletop Bellhop could review. So here we are talking gamer luggage again. One of the best things I ever bought at Origins, this goes back to Origins 2014, was a handy haversack from Old World Designs. Besides being a great bag to carry around a con with lots of room to hold games, I want to play as well as the new stuff I bought while walking around. It's great for showing off my gamerness. This is one piece of gamer swag I own that I get asked, where'd you get that? The most often, especially for some reason in elevators. Whenever I get in an elevator, I think people have nothing else to do, so they kind of look around, and they don't want to make eye contact, so they're looking low. I always get the, hey, cool bag, where'd you get that? And to answer, uh, you can go right to offworlddesigns.com and buy it there, but they are also at pretty much every major con. Uh, they sell bags like this, but they also do the t-shirts, and I, I've even bought my dad some beer mugs from there with some cool D&D type stuff on it. Now, if custom luggage isn't your thing, you can always decorate the bags you already have with plenty of gamer bling. That is true, too. I've done that. We'll get to some of that gamer bling later. The other thing I've got is a backpack of holding. Now, we're going back to ThinkGeek because ThinkGeek has a couple of these. This is a great RPG bag that I wished existed when I was in my teens carrying Warhammer to the ro local gaming club every Saturday night because it fits a good chunk of books. I got to say probably five to six hardcover rule books. And then it's got all these pouches all over it for your dice, pencils, miniatures. Uh, this one's also great if I want to spend the day working at the coffee shop because it's got a padded pouch that's perfect for a laptop or tablet. This is also what I used to bring when I ran D&D &D at the, the local game store. Uh, it's surprisingly comfortable, holds more than it looks like it does. Uh, especially because the top actually folds over. I've got it back there. I don't know if you can see it, but like the top actually folds up so it can be twice as tall. Um, the other thing this is great for is at cons, when I'm not planning on buying a lot of stuff, it's great because it's got two side pouches that are perfect for holding bottles of water and some small snacks, like granola bars, which if anyone ever goes to a con, carry water, bring snacks. It's important. Now, even if it is gamer gear, it doesn't have to be relegated to that gamer shelf. Bring it out for anything, and not just when you're heading to the local FLGS. You never know where you'll run into another gamer and make that connection. Very true. Well, this may not work for that, because it's not instantly recognizable as a piece of gamer gear. I got to give a shout out to the Quiver from Quiver Time. The Quiver is an awesome piece of gamer luggage designed for carrying card games to and from game night. Now, I had the chance to review a Quiver back in November and was extremely impressed by the quality of this product in Quiver Time. I now own two of them, one of which is probably soon to be filled with a bunch of key forge cards for a trip up the breakout con. And I'm actually debating getting one for the DC cards now that I'm getting really frustrated with their own storage ah. system. There's another review we should get you to do at some point. Yeah. So next up, put a pin in it. Yeah, this is a thing I didn't somehow just missed. I, I didn't realize was a thing. When we were at Origins 2018, just last year, they had this thing called Pin Bazaar. And this was this cool scavenger hunt style thing that ran through the entire con and the entire conference center. You went up to the customer service booth and you got a set of these really nice metal and enamel pins uh, that said like Origins, Pin Bazaar. There were three of them you got. And then you hunted around the dealer hall for participating vendors, each of which had a branded pin, which was usually their company logo or whatever their popular game, like uh, Renegade Games had a Farlight 
uh, pin or their game mascot, like you could get the um, Munchkin, Munchkin, or whatever on it. Right now, most of the com- most of the companies were giving these away free with any purchase. Some were selling them. The Overlight one you just paid for. Other of other companies were really cool. Where if you just sat through a demo game, they'd give you a pin. And I just thought this was a a really cool game within a game at the con. So while well, new to Mo, this is in really ge- a new ho- a new hobby in general. Pin collecting, yeah. major events and conferences, it's a huge deal. And something I've been running into for years, working behind the scenes at various conferences and conventions. Uh, for the hardcore collectors, they're actually called pinners, and it is a very big business. Full sets of pins from some events, like the Olympics, can go for massive money on the secondary market. Yeah, see, I don't know if Origins was doing this before. This is the first time I've seen it. And i got to say, in it wasn't until taking part in this last year at origins that i started to notice how many gamers collect pins because after origins we went to queen city conquest and it was at qcc i really started to notice it like i swear everyone that had a hat had pins in it everyone that had a bag had pins on them people had pins on their lanyards people had pins on their clothing every all around there were gamers with pins i'm like oh this is really cool so that haversack i mentioned uh i brought the cons now holds my collection of pins now I've got pins from podcasts I enjoy, pins from cons I've attended, and pins from companies whose games I take. Now I don't have much yet. I'm just kind of starting on this journey. But I, I don't know. I dig them. I like having them. I like showing it off, especially being able to advertise someone's podcast. Heck, maybe we should print up some tabletop bellhop pins with our bell logo on them and hand them out next time we're at. Now the other thing I see digging into this a little further excuse me is there are a ridiculous number of awesome gamer pins out there on the net and wow etsy is a fantastic place for these i took a quick look like just browsing i'm like i'll admit i'm tempted but then i kind of want mine to have uh, some sentimental value like all of my pins i have now came from a con so tied into them are the con memories but if you just want to buy cool looking pins to show them off uh etsy is a great place to find them yeah, no, absolutely. And if you want to take pinning to the next level, there's actually a purely pinner store in Brooklyn <laughs> in the $125 per square foot, you know, um, area, retail area <laughs> that works with designers, artists, and brands to create a lifestyle brand of pins. <laughs> uh, if you're interested, there's pintrill.com for their online store, and you can see that. Uh, it was kind of, yeah, that's <laughs> next, next, <laughs> next level. level. Yeah. Taking it up to the next level. Yep. So, I think what we, we have to do next is uh, we got to design a game around the pins. Ah, that, that, that's step leveling it up. Next up, patch it up. Yeah, I know Shadzar posted this one in the patch. He said, don't forget patches. We did not forget patches. Similar to pins, you can find a growing number of gamer-related iron-on or so-on patches out there. Uh, These, for some reason, I I wasn't blind to. I've seen people wearing patches for years, uh, mostly more back in the day in the denim jacket, but also on back pats and such. Uh, Personally, I've got a couple of really cool OSR RPG patches that come from um, a really cool old-school gamer, Thaddeus Moore. He makes and sells them over social media. I've been telling him set up an Etsy store, and he's like, oh, I'm not a store, and when they run out, they're going to run whatever. Um, I, there's a link on the blog. We'll put a link in the show notes. If you are into old-school gaming, these are really cool. He's even got one that looks like the Conan logo with a sword through it. Very cool badges. Um, i got to admit, though, I haven't actually attached them to anything, but I plan on putting them on our back, my backpack of holding. Now, if you're looking for RPG patches of your own, again, I got to point to Etsy. Patches, pins, stuff like that. Etsy is the the wellspring. That's the, so many people making so much awesome stuff on there. There's a great selection over there covering a wide range of quality and prices. Now, I got to say, I've noticed one thing. I only tend to see the patches for RPGs. Like, I've seen a couple Meeple, but that's about it. I don't see a lot of board game patches. I don't know if board gamers want to spend more money so they want pins because I see board game pins. I'm not sure what it is. Uh, For me, the patches are more of a throwback to the days when denim coats were actually all the rage. I've never been a much of a patch fan myself, but there's certainly a wide range available. So I guess there's a major demographic out there that I'm just not in. You must have a bag you carry around from work, though, or something you could put patches on. Uh, Mine mine are uh, mine are all branded uh, like duffel bags and things i don't, I don't yeah. really have patchable stuff um next up shout it out 
All right. Besides wearing and carrying your gamer geek flag, you can also just get out there and talk about it. This is the easiest thing to do. Look, we're doing it right now. Is your Facebook feed all about your pets, kids, and your latest culinary creation? How about taking part in What Did You Play Mondays once a week? So all you have to do, keep sharing the rest of the stuff for your family to like and talk about how good it looks and how cute your kids are. But on Monday, just go on there and talk about the games you played the week previous. You don't have to talk about gaming all the time. Heck, even I don't talk about gaming all the time. Just get it out there now and then. Share a picture of your latest game on Instagram. Check in on Foursquare when you're at the FLGS. Connect your board game account to Board Game Geek account to Twitter so that it shares all on your feed anytime you log a play. I say shout it out all over social media. Hey folks, I'm a tabletop gamer and I'm proud of it. What do you do to fly the tabletop gamer flag? Let us know in the comments or send us a message at uh, mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, this was a great talk. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night topics like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you'll see this and other topics answered in blog form. Yeah, if you've got a question for us, head over to the website, click on Ask the Bellhop, or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. So let's see what's up in the lobby. Now that we've got our main topic out there, I saw a lot of stuff scrolling on. What do the people here on Twitch have to say about flying the gamer flag? Well, there, uh, Shadzar is bringing up. We got you didn't really talk about uh, stickers or lanyards, oh, stickers. lanyards, and those uh, the hospital bracelets, like the the sign in bracelets. A lot of people collect all the uh, you know their lanyards and and tags and, and ways of checking into various. Um, these checking into various stuff. Yeah, that's <laughs> that would be it. Uh, yeah, I got a few of those. I hadn't even thought of that. That's a good one. I I, I could see going to a con wearing your big trouble in Little China. Yeah, land. there we go. I don't have my gaming ones were all ones given to me, so I don't I don't have ones I can share very well. Poncho wants bellhop swag. What would you be interested in? Like are you looking for pins, patches? You looking what we what we could probably do this. Well, we definitely need to do t shirts. I mean yeah. really I wish we were I wish we had time for t shirts for uh for breakout, but I don't I think that's probably cutting it a little close unless we just oh, slap a oh, logo no. on something. But uh so I was thinking, would we do T-shirts or would we do? Um, I, I was thinking for us, we do some kind of collared shirt, though that kind of defeats the whole thing we just talked about. <laughs> shirts, okay. So Poncho is interested in tabletop bellhop shirts. Because I mean, we'll even have to, if we, to look at. Yeah, even if we just had um, the bell and the bell and bars logo on a shirt, you know. I'd so I was just thinking, that, yeah, the bell, the tabletop bellhop bell and bars over the breast kind of thing just to show off the thing i do like the uh deanna is noting uh pound or hashtag extreme edition yeah. but i don't think i use the e i think it's just capital x extreme edition we play extreme that would probably yeah. fit pretty good less shame more game uh yeah no that that tag did not take off i thought that would go somewhere yeah, but I, first rule is a little long. i know like when i'm when i'm when i'm standing at the back of the uh the the, the various um Things with my camera, I, I certainly wouldn't mind having uh, some bellhop swag that will be visible. Be, even be just visible for us, right? Like, yeah. Even if we're not selling. Because that's the other thing you can do with Cafe Press. Cafe Press, you can set up your own store. What I would do is I would talk to, ooh, a bell meeple, distracted by the chat. If I talk <laughs> to, I know Gaming and BS has a, a whole bunch of swag that they do, and just talk to them, what store have they set up, how do they have it set up. Just I have mean, to put some we can do, on. We can do, we can do simple uh, logo merch right here on uh, Twitch. Uh, Streamlabs has a store that where we just we just need to upload right. the graphics and it'll do it for us. Well, we um, have at least one interested person, so that sounds like something we should work on. What do we, we put a bell in it? Put a pin in it? <laughs> we have the Hurton Albertan says we should sell meeples of ourselves. Oh, well, there we go. I, I don't know. What would a, what would a meeple? Uh, you've at least got the beard thing going. I shaved this week so mine uh, i don't even have like the big beard anymore <laughs> a meeple with a bunch of gray i don't know <laughs> well you've got the hair i've got the beard you've oh yeah you can't really tell i got the hair <laughs> i have to start wearing around the front because it's always pulled back i don't know it's some good ideas i definitely hey if, if someone wants to wear our merch <laughs> I, okay how could i say bot has great timing i have to say yes who look at their jerks and they smell bad <laughs> Oh, beard, epic eyebrows. There you go. I have epic eyebrows. Okay, there we go. Thank you, Hurton Alberton. <laughs> Welcome to the chat. I don't recognize your name. 
I need to get the show notes back up, or we're going to be here all night. Yep. Of course, this part may not, may or may not end up in the final podcast. But yeah, no, some good ideas. There was something else I saw in there, and I missed it now. There was something Chad's are suggested. Well, they were... With stickers. Stickers is a good one. I didn't even think of stickers. Yeah. I, I, the only problem with stickers, where do you stick them? Like, if people put yeah. them on their laptops and their phones, but... Yeah, I mean, la- and laptops aren't really... I mean, laptops are kind of... I guess, I guess uh, tablets more often now than the laptops, to some degree. Phones... Phones, I am. Most people just have a case on them, so you don't yeah. necessarily see stuff. Entry Games had... No, it's gone. Had a Meeple here, but I think oh, it yeah. fell off. Oh, it's on her laptop. There you go. Oh, okay. She's got a Meeple on her that laptop. That was actually from Chris Cormier's Geeky Yeah, that's from when Geeky Goodies. T-shirts. When you buy t-shirts from me, he sends you stickers. Okay. I've got an Extra Life sticker on my car. There we go. That is something I would buy if I could find a, a nice... It's like some... You know, the stuff... Not the families, but the other stuff people put, the vinyl stickers. Oh, like if Meeple, I could find Meeple vinyl stickers? A meeple I don't family? know. I don't know if I do meeple, <laughs> but like a D twenty or something, right? right? Like something that more RPG or Thaddeus should do OSR versions, the OSR logos. So you got you got a D twenty, a D twelve, and then a couple of D fours. <laughs> oh, there you go. That's cute, actually. That's a good idea. Uh... <laughs> I I scrolled, so I got to figure out where we're at. We're at announcements. See, I'm screwed up because we yep. switched our order. Eyebrows. Oh, they, if I could do a meeple holding a bell, if you could somehow get that. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is a company that does custom meeple. That would be kind of cool if the two of us, should, if we had three meeple for the three of us and we like handed that out. It wouldn't go to everyone, but like yeah. if we we're a special guest or whatever, that'd be kind of cool. Like the Buffalo meeple we got when we we're at uh, QCC. Anyway, moving on. Announcements time. We're growing through the support of fans like you, so if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Whatever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we've released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, reviews, and anything else we create. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. All three of us, Sean, myself, and Deanna, will be at Breakout Con March 15th to 17th, coming up very, very soon. I hope to see some of you there. Such a great event with RPGs, LARPs, miniatures, and a fantastic board game room with a huge game library, along with a massive list of panel discussions covering all manners of topics, and now they've added a sealed deck Keyforge tournament with a separate entry fee. Yeah, just today on Facebook, they're also adding a painting clinic, miniature painting clinic. That was announced today. And they're still announcing guests. Like, I swear, every day they announce three more guests. Yeah, I, I don't, don't know, know if anyone's actually them. paying to go to that con. <laughs> I don't know where they're putting them all because they had a very full schedule <laughs> of discussions. And yet they are they keep adding more people. It's true. Like, I, I got to go back and look at the schedule again because there's probably a whole bunch of new stuff on there now. Yeah. Uh, anyway, even with all the stuff going on, right now I've left a bunch of gaps in my schedule for meeting people and networking. So if you're one of those people that wants to hook up, get a hold of me on social media. We'll talk and maybe we can meet up during the con. Uh, as a note to our stream friends, we'll likely not be streaming anything live that weekend, including Gloomhaven, as we're all going to be out of town. Uh, if we're lucky, we might manage to squeeze in a, a little Keyforge or something uh uh, if we can get the uh, a decent connection, but uh, nothing official. Yeah, the way the Wi-Fi was there last year and the way just streaming over mobile has been, it's probably unlikely. So, yeah, there is going to be a gap in our schedule. Um, for the podcast and everything else, though, we should still be good. Everything will still be coming out normal. Yep, yeah, yeah, it's just the uh, it's just uh, just a gloomhaven really that gets you that gets affected. Uh, just a heads up, we're still looking for sponsors and advertisers. If this is something you're interested in, fire off an email to mo at tabletopbellhop.com. Today, we've got something different for you. A review from Sean. That's right. And while it's not a game, it's certainly something that many of the serious gamers will appreciate, but also something that can be great for family gamers, too. It turns out... There is an app for that, and in this case, that app is Board Game Stats. And what it's for, well, I think that's pretty obvious from the name. Now, back around New Year's, uh, someone on Twitter posted this great little collection of images showing off all their gaming stats from the prior year. It really caught my eye, geek that I am, so I inquired and got told about this app, 
and followed them on Twitter at, at BG Stats app. Now, first off, this is available on both Android and iOS, but I'm an Android guy, so I can't really speak to anything on the iOS side. Uh, I do know from their advertising that there is some connection to uh, Nemistats or Nemistats.com that only exists in the iOS version, but beyond that, I haven't used it. Uh, we should mention that it's not a free app. It's $2.99 US, and there are optional add-ons for the app. Now, for me, this wasn't a deal breaker, but I can understand how it might be for some. For instance, everything this app does, you can do in Excel or Google Sheets combined with Board Game Geek. Uh, and Nemistat seems to be another popular option for gaming stats, which has a lot of these options. Uh, and it also has a connection directly to Board Game Geek. Now, the basics, the app functionality is deceivingly simple and really depends on how much information you want to share with it. Uh, if you want to log that you played a game, great, you're done. Just tap twice and you're done. Uh, and once you enter the game the first time, it syncs the actual game information and, and box covers and everything from Board Game Geek. <laughs> it's always there in your game list when you want to play it again. Uh, if you want to track who you played with, no problem. Those people are added to a list as well, and it's just a matter of tapping on them after you've tapped on the game. Uh, if you want to keep it anonymous, you don't want to be uh, talking about who else you're playing with, not a problem. You just tap anonymous players, and those get added in just the same as uh, with another player. Uh, now, if you, all that is automatically filled out, like the date, all there. If you want locations, all your normal locations, again, get filled into an auto, uh, auto, auto fill list. Um, and just easy to tap and go. Uh, and if you want more detail, there are game counters, round counters, game timers built in, uh, sections for comments, expansions, versions. You want to store images of your game? No problem. It's all right there right when you tap the add a, uh, add, add a play, which is the main button on the home screen. So you mentioned add-ons that you pay two ninety nine, dollars but then there's more you can get. What can you add on to this? It sounds like it's kind of got everything already. Plus, what is it they think you'd want to pay for? So for the average user, you get everything for two ninety nine. dollars It really is there. I haven't actually bothered paying for anything extra. But they do have some additions. So the first thing they offer is for 99 cents US a year, uh, Cloud Sync. So multiple devices, their own private backup, separate from Board Game Geek. Uh, mm. And uh, eventually they're talking about some inter app play. So you and I would be able to, if we were both users, would be able to share a little more data back and forth more easily within their environment. Uh, but again, 99 cents a year, and it's not something I've needed at this point. Uh, the next thing they offer is deep stats. Now, okay. the stats they have in this in this app, straight off with the original purchase, are fantastic. Um, you get your scoring, your win-loss percentages, and all that. Uh, you get when, how often you play, what games you play, how many games. Uh, but if you go for the deep stats, which is a one-time $2.99 purchase, uh, it gets a lot deeper. It goes right into all the minutia. So basically, as much data as you're willing to share with it, it's willing to dig into and analyze for you. Um, so for the real stats geeks, that's something you're probably, you may uh, definitely want. Uh, and then finally, they have challenges. So all the, the 10 by 10 and the 10 by 100 and all the various okay. board game challenges that are out there, they have their own system for sort of keeping track of that for you. So you don't have to worry about uh, dealing with that. It will keep track of it for you. And you can build your own challenges as well. So that's got, in the base. Uh, and that's no, that's an extra. It's, uh, it's another. I think it's a dollar fifty or something um, uh, extra uh, add-on. Again, I don't use any of those challenges, so I haven't uh, haven't done that. But it's got all the standard ones. Plus, you can build your own um, challenges, and uh, you can even set things to be hardcore. So once ah. you've set yourself into a challenge, you can't back out of it or change the challenge. Um, okay. So so little little fun things like that for a little extra. Um, now you, this, you mentioned per year is all of this is a no, one time. What's every, one time. Everything, fee, what's everything per... is one time except for the cloud sync cloud sync okay. is 99 cents a year, 99 cents us a year. Everything else is a one time fee. Okay. That's I, one time fees are much better. I hate no, absolutely. monthly um, fees. And again, for apps. Now this, this app does sync with board game geek. So unless you feel the need or you don't want to use board game geek and you'd rather use a private cloud sync, you don't need to. Uh, you don't need to bother 
uh, because Board Game Geek stores everything for you as mm-hmm. a, basically as a backup. Uh, everything everything I put into Board Game Stats goes right to Board Game Geek. Okay. Uh, and if I enabled the tweeting like you do, uh, when I mm-hmm. when I entered it into the app, Board Game Geek would tweet it out for me, just like it does for yours. Um, so right off the top, we've uh, we've tracked, you know, without basically any effort. We've uh, just by sitting at my phone, as soon as I finish a game uh, in seconds, I know when I've played, who I've played with, what the score was, uh, where I played. um, And, 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 you know, if I've used any expansions all right there, sitting on my phone. Uh, So that expansion part's nice. So on board game geek, you have to log a play of an expansion separate from logging a play of a game, which is one of the things where I have a problem with the Twitter because say I play Carcassonne with all 10 expansions. I just spammed every one of my followers with, I played this and this and this and this and this, and that drives me nuts. Right. And this is, so this actually has it tied in. Yeah. It's just a separate field in there for, for entering in uh, what you play. So you basically, you play the core game, but you've recorded in a, in a specific field for expansions, what expansions you have in. Uh, on everything um and so yeah you know it's it's really easy and that's that's the thing and um you're happy with bgg i know that and you (laughs) you log in on you log in on your phone uh and log your plays there uh for me i hate bgg Uh, i think you know it's fantastic it's 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 one of the most fantastic resources but it's ugly um and i i don't find it especially user-friendly especially on on mobile uh it's you know, on a full screen app, it's a little easier. Whereas this is designed for mobile. I open up my phone, and the first thing I see when I when I open up that app is my stats for the last thirty days, what games I've played, who I've played with, uh, how many times I've played what games, uh, and with one button, I'm in a list of games, and with one another tap, I've, I'm entering all the information. So, for me, it's that little bit less friction than going into Board Game Geek. All right. Yeah, like I don't, I don't have this app. I'm perfectly happy to log into Board Game Geek on my phone and log my plays there. You just search the game, click on Add a Play, a little wizard pops up. To about two, three taps. Uh, far as I can tell, though, it's a lot of the same info, if not identical. Is there anything BG Stats tracks that BGG doesn't, or the other way around, or is it well, pretty much a complete port I of think, the two? I think more or less, uh, from what I know, aside from the expansions thing, uh, it is pretty much the same. Uh, the right. difference is BG Stats actually gives you stats without, you know, Board Game Geek has all the information, whereas BG yeah, Stats true. actually has, you know, again, when I open it up, I've got, uh, you know, pie charts and bar graphs right there in front of me, mm-hmm. letting me know how I'm playing. Um, well, that's all on BGG. You just have to know where to find it. Right. And it's on your username. And then you have to tab to about the eight tab to look at your stats. And it's there. It just, it's the, the amazing user interface. Yeah. Like, like, if any company out there needs to hire a UI developer, it's BGG. Well, you know, they, they did upgrade their game pages. All they need yeah, is the other 95% of the website. <laughs> I didn't, And I don't find the game pages all that much better either. So They, they aren't. Well, thanks for the info. I don't know. I'm still not sold. I think I think I need to play with your copy. Like the next time you're down, I'll like borrow your phone and play with it and, sure. and see just how much quicker it is than me going on board game. I'm just so used to doing it. It's, well, it's yeah. the you've I'm got, old and a, I don't like change. You've got a muscle. <laughs> you've got a muscle memory, so for you it's right. fine. Uh, for me, I started you know literally uh, at midnight on New Year's Eve. Yeah, I started recording apps for the first time, uh, plays for the first time. I thought it was ridiculous and I wasn't going to ever do it. Uh, yeah, like I, said, I think I said on the podcast at one point that it yeah. was something I was never going to do. Yeah, you were never going to log plays. Uh, but uh, I found this app and I'm like, oh, this is like really frictionless and easy. So, You know what? Now that I do this, it's even more useful than it used to be. But it always came up. It'd be like, oh, when was the last time I played this? Or when did this happen? Or especially for the challenges, right? How many times did you play a game is important. But it's also useful when for the podcast and the show. For Heck, when I do the... Um, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, sometimes I got to look and I'm like, wait, what did I play last week? Well, and I can go through me, and go, yeah, here's the games I played. Yeah, for me, I check because I, I pull up the, you know, the all games played and look from Monday to Monday because I I don't yeah. always think about when we when when it is there. So a lot of times I'll play yeah. three games, but they were on Tuesday and well, that's for next week's episode. Yeah, that happens a lot too. The nonlinear podcasting messes with me now and then. I thought about switching it, but you know what? It works for the block. 
So seeing as I'm going to be talking about Gloomhaven every week, now that we're streaming it every Friday, there's now more of an obligation that we actually play every week. It seemed to make sense to make this a regular segment on the show instead of it being buried in with our Tabletop Gaming Weekly segment. Now, in addition to the change here on the show, starting next week, actually, I think uh, we were talking about this morning, it's going to be on Fridays, I'm going to start doing a separate blog post for our Gloomhaven updates as well, which is going to include an embedded version of the YouTube actual play video. So you're not going to have to go find it on YouTube anywhere. It'll be right there, right on tabletopbellhop.com. Follow along for the ongoing adventures of Cator, D, and the Bellhop as they explore <laughs> Gloomhaven together with our viewers. The whole Kator thing, I'm still amused that, that that picked up and caught on. So last Friday, we were a player short again. Someone, Tori, felt the need to have a bachelor party before he gets married, so he couldn't come game with us. I don't know why he would think that's so important. Now, I tried to suggest just, like, have a gaming bachelor party, but some people, for some reason, have friends who aren't into gaming. And I, I don't get it, but to each their own. See, we should have game for my bachelor party instead of just drinking and convincing huge that we really weren't going to be going to the peelers. <laughs> yeah, probably. They probably would have had a better night. Now, I got to admit, I'm, I'm not one to talk. Uh, Deanna and I did a Jack and Jill, and it was all about local craft beer and pizza and way, way too many prizes my mom and sister we buy so that every guest walked away with like six things, I think it was, by the end of the night. But anyway, no gaming. Uh but anyway, what this means overall, that we were short another player. So that meant for us another random dungeon. Uh, this was a three-player one because we did convince Kat to come out, who, despite the fact she figured she was going to get texts all night from drunk guys. Uh, so it was just Deanna, Kat, and I, and surprisingly only one text. We started off with our usual town adventure, which I just learned today is us playing completely wrong, and you're not allowed to do that while playing a casual game or a random dungeon. But I didn't realize that on Friday. So we did our town adventure. We had a city thing. And then we did some shopping because um, we had a bunch of money after raiding that temple. Uh, we also got blessed, which, again, I learned today you're not allowed to do on a casual game. So, again, playing extreme without realizing it. Uh, Got to love the Grove of the Sacred Oak in general uh, because that bumped up our prosperity level, though it shouldn't have because it ends up we were breaking the rules. So we got to decide if we're going to try to backtrack some stuff we've marked off because we've been, I think we figured it out. Uh, Kat and I were talking. It looks like we bumped that eight times that we shouldn't have. Mm. Now this goes with something we'll get to in a bit and errata. So it ends up it's not mentioned in the rule book. But going to that prosperity, we're going to pretend we played everything properly. So now we are one tick away from prosperity level three, assuming we played properly and weren't cheating. Now, I don't think I've talked about prosperity. So I want to spend a minute on that because people who don't know Gloomhaven may not know this aspect of the game. And I got to say, it's been kind of neat that there's been these discoveries as we played the game. Like the fact that somehow with all the hype on Gloomhaven, I didn't know you could start multiple parties and have different groups of people playing the same copy of the game. Uh, prosperity is not that groundbreaking, but it's one of those things that as you do things through the game, you get prosperity goes up. And that represents the town itself uh, getting better, becoming more prosperous. Uh, it means you got a bigger town, more people have moved in, new shops open up, and so on. Now, mechanically, it means two things. First, if anyone starts a new character in the game, they start at a minimum level equal to the current prosperity level. So right now, anyone who starts a new character in my copy of Gloomhaven will start at level two, uh, and very soon, hopefully, level three. The other thing that happens, though, is that new items are added to the item deck when you hit a new prosperity level. And based on what we saw when we hit level two, there is some sweet stuff in those item decks. So it's just another way the game scales and evolves with continued play. And it's one of the things I'm really digging about Gloomhaven overall. And it's very interesting that it impacts other future players. <laughs> now, does that infect the difficulty level at all? Does it, uh, if, it, if I were to start a game in your world now with this expanded inventory, would the game also be harder to compensate? Well, the way the game scales is based on the average party, well, on the party level. It's not quite the average party level. It's actually the average party level divided by two rounded up. So if everyone's third level with new characters, the normal scenario difficulty would be level two. So, for example, in a random dungeon, we were playing on scenario level three. 
with that, I've started to notice that while the monsters are getting tougher, they don't seem to be getting quite as tough as we are. And to me, I think that's a good thing. Like, I, I like this style of leveling up. It feels like we've accomplished something and our characters are getting more complicated or more competent. Well, they're also getting more complicated, but the, the feel of them being more competent characters. Now, I'm not a big fan of RPGs where the monsters scale with the party exactly, where a fight at level one feels pretty much like the same fight at level 10, except at level 10, all the numbers are bigger. Um, I like to call that the fantasy, or not fantasy flight, the, the final fantasy effect, where that first fight in the first town, you're doing two damage. And then the last fight, when you're fighting the boss, you're doing 2000 damage. But overall, the fight took just as long as the first one did. And you probably hit attack just about as many times. I'm pleased to say Gloomhaven doesn't seem to be falling into that trap. And a good thing, too, is you aren't exactly running into easy opponents. Oh. I feel like that heavy <laughs> artillery this week could have really smashed the U from a few weeks ago. No, oh, I agree. Uh, those range five, that range five in the small rooms, that's just nasty. Like, no matter where they were, they could hit us. No matter where we went, they could hit us. Um, that, that was nasty. And then there was the one card that came up and they could shoot even farther. I'm like, holy cow. Yeah, I, I definitely think a couple levels ago that would not have gone as well as it did last stream. Now, looking back at last game, week's game, I got to admit, I didn't take up a lot of notes. I didn't take a lot of notes last week. I didn't even record what rooms we went into. Uh, I know we had one repeat set of monsters, so we had fought that particular combo before. But we also faced some new stuff for the first time, like those ancient artillery you just mentioned. Uh, overall, I think it's seemed to go really well until we hit a major stumbling block on the last room. When trying to set up that last room, we, we couldn't. We hit a, a snag. Based on the tiles it told us to use and the card that shows you how to lay the tiles out, you couldn't do it. It didn't work. Like, you could attach the pieces via, you know, the puzzle cut. If you did that, it didn't match the card. The, the room was, like, backwards and you couldn't fit the scenery. If we actually just then match the art, not only did the puzzle pieces not match up, it ends up the hexes didn't even line up. So that didn't work. Like, I tried, and then I'm like, Deanna's like, I don't know, if you, you, you're not smart enough to figure this out, give it to me, I'll do it. No, she couldn't figure it out e either. Neither of us could actually make the map that was on the cards. It was impossible. So that's when I went on BGG uh, while I was watching and found the FAQ that yeah. some cards had been printed with flipped art and that the art should be ignored. However, a little bit more digging referred to that as a release one problem only. Mm -hmm. And this isn't a release one version of the game that you guys are playing. No, it's not. And you can't just ignore it. It says ignore the art, but the problem is it wasn't just like the physical art. The hexes were laid out different. So we couldn't actually fit all the scenery in the spots it showed on the cards. So it, it just didn't work. So then we figured out if we mirrored the card, so, like, the entrance is supposed to be here, instead it's over here, and the bookcase is supposed to be here, instead it's on the other side. We could at least lay it up, set it up, which is, I guess, works, but, like, that could have changed the whole difficulty of the scenario. It definitely changed the line of sight. Like, looking on the card, you should have had line of sight from the door to the door, and we didn't have that. And like Sean just mentioned, I have the second printing. I kickstarted the second printing. I don't have sliders on my on my uh, my player boards. Instead, I have the dials for XP and health. Right? Like I know I have a second edition. So despite what it's saying on that FAQ, it's not just a version one problem. And I gotta say, I'm I'm bummed. Like like just by mirroring the card, we were able to play. But like this is not a cheap game. And it, I have the second printing. This is the kind of thing you expect to be printed. Like this is a huge printing error and it makes me worry. It's going to come up again. Like, is there anything wrong in the scenario book or is just, we happen to get the one random dungeon card that doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, while there's a chance, this could be something else. The fact that no one at the table could build the room no. as it seemed, it should be built according to everything in front of them. It's an issue. No matter what the problem yeah. causing it could be, that's an issue. No, I agree completely. This is the first major hit against Gloomhaven, I got to say. Like, there's been a couple little things here and there, but, like, no, this is this is bad. Like, th th this is, makes that one card technically unplayable. And, again, I don't know how widespread this problem is. So, today, to research that, I went and found this massive FAQ. And, oh, my God, does that game have a ridiculous amount of errata? 
even the V2. And that's where I learned that they're missing the section that says you only get to do a town encounter when returning from a campaign mission, and you only get to the, go to the Grove of the Sacred Oak when returning from a campaign mission, and you can't do that in random dungeons. That is not in the rule book. We double-checked. So that, like, yes, we played the extreme version. It ends up the last three random dungeons we played. And I was starting to think it seems odd to be eating through the campaign deck of encounters while playing random dungeons, but I couldn't see a reason why not. And they're fun, so we kept doing it. So I actually sent a copy to, we have a little Facebook chat uh, where we talk about whether we're going to play or not and who's showing up and everything. And I sent a copy of that FAQ in. Like I said, it's massive. And I don't know, part of me wants to just throw out the FAQ and just say, we'll play with the rules as written because we have, and we'll follow the rules in the book. But then there's some stuff that does seem to... Uh, be better, right? Like, I was worried about using up those town cards if we just kept doing random dungeons. Which, that's one more heads up for anyone watching live now. This won't come out in the podcast. This Friday, it's another random dungeon again. It's probably going to be a two-player random dungeon. Tori and Kat seem to want to get married, and I guess that takes all kinds of meetings, and people only want to meet on Saturdays. I, I think gaming is more important, but hey, they can get married some other time. But, oh, well, it looks like it's going to be just Deanna and I this week, two-player dungeon, with no town adventure and no blessings. Well, that means you'll definitely have time to get in another play afterwards if you... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> That's true. We might get in... Um, I, I, we might stream something else after Gloomhaven, so you have to ch stop in after the... Or stop into the live show and you'll get to see us possibly play something else. Yep. Yeah, it's almost, I, it's almost worth it uh, to sort of take some time and go through the FAQ and basically, and almost, you know, pick and choose what you want to, you know, yeah. fix, fix the really broken stuff. Anything that's actually yes. broken, fix that, you know, you know, glue in little uh, overlays on your, on your <laughs> manual. And then the rest of it that he just left out and forgot to tell people, well, sorry, you should have put it in the rule book in the first place. Uh yeah, no, it's giving me flashbacks to 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Okay, I don't want to get into a big, is it good, is it bad, but 4th edition Dungeons & Dragons, the original printing of the Player's Handbook, eventually had more pages of errata than more pages in the rulebook. But Wizards of the Coast printed them out, so it looked like it was formatted like it. So I literally would print them, cut them out, and post-it note them into my Player's Handbook so that my version of it had all the latest rules because at that time I was actually a herald level DM for Wizards of the Coast. Like I had to go online and take a test and I had a card that said I could run D&D. They don't do this anymore, right? People who run D&D encounters now can be anyone, which is good to open up the hobby, but then you don't know if you have a quality DM there. I actually had to take a test to run those. And part of that was when I ran my games, I had to run it using the latest version of the rules. So I had to go on every, I think it was once a month and then, grab the latest errata. So all, all my copies of the original Player's Handbook, Player's Handbook 2, Dungeon Master's Guide, have, like, I didn't glue them, I taped them in, but taped in errata through the whole book. So, anyone in the lobby have any comments about either board game stats or on Gloomhaven? Well, I know some people are, are thinking, uh, why why bother tracking everything? And I have to say, I was one of those people. <laughs> um, but you know what? When I saw the the, the stats availability, and and uh, especially now because I am doing the podcast and we are doing and we are doing all this, so to be able to being able to talk about it and uh, and forcing myself to play more games, one of the things I've really noticed is when I open up that and I realize, oh wow, I haven't played anything. I should eat, you know, even if I just sit down and play an Ascension or something, you know, yeah. play more games. I, uh, you know, there's some there's some that shame in there where you see that you haven't played anything in a while and your your stats are dropping. When Sean mentioned it back at the at the top of the podcast, uh, he is a nerd, and nerds like stats. Yep. That, that's a thing. That's one of the things that draws us to RPGs, right? You know, to look. Oh, I played this, and it tracked this, and this went up. And man, I haven't played this in a long time. Oh, it's gamifying gamifying the game itself. You know, yep. playing of games essentially. That, there, you can bring it to the next step. You got to put play to game this week and put that in Habitica. Uh, yeah, I don't have gaming in there. I've got I've got. <laughs> I've got a number of geeky things in there, but not gaming. There you go. I don't, I don't have anything geeky. Why? Well, I have like like promote the podcast. Well, I'm actually in the pod. There, there was a February podcast challenge, so listening. Oh, to I podcasts missed that one. Gives me points. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah, I need to do more with that. That's something we could talk about on a later show. 
Yeah. I need, we need more people in our party is what we need. So anyone in the chat or listening, if you use Habitica, which is like a gamify, you put in things you want to do, you level up, you, you eventually pick a class. I learned that this week. Uh, let us know. We're looking for people in our party. We've already defeated the dust bunnies. Yes, we defeated the dust bunny. Now we're looking for moon shards. Red although, ketchup, thank you for the bits, as usual. Although I it had, is highly appreciated. I could not change uh, quests in the app. I had to, yeah, I that had was to go to the website in order to change quests. That was ridiculous. See, Poncho says we should stop Gloomhaven and go to Blackstone Fortress. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Warhammer Quest is cool, but uh, Warhammer 40k version of Warhammer Quest is, I don't know. I, I, I'm a fan of 40k, but I much prefer fantasy. More likely, though, I do have Warhammer Quest Silver Tower which is the fantasy version where you actually explore a tower of Zinch and it looks really neat. And it's, that's how they explain that, how everything's determined randomly. Cause it's Zinch. It looks cool. But when I bought it, I had no clue. It was a games workshop hobby game. Like every Warhammer quest back in the eighties and nineties came with pre-assembled miniatures. You just put them on a base and played. These are one of those where like the weapons, the arms are all separate. You can pose them different ways. And I'm like, there's about three to eight hours work in that box before I can play. And it's, it's on the pile of shame. It's second from the bottom. Conan is at the bottom of the pile of shame, holding up the pile of shame above that is Warhammer quest, the silver tower. So no, no urge to get into black stone fortress, at least not yet. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tabletops? Uh, every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at tabletopbellhop.com under On the Table. As mentioned at the top of the show, I've got some expansions off my piles of shame. I got war chests, some dinosaurs, some stained glass, and I want to talk a bit about Race for the Galaxy on Board Game Arena this week. I've got DC uh, card games and Harry Potter and my gamer shame, a first oh. time with Carcassonne. The Carc Cherry. <laughs> So Saturday, I went to the CG Realms twice monthly game night with the plan to get two to three things off my pile of shame. I brought my copy of Brass Birmingham, Villages of Valeria with two unplayed expansions, Zolkin with an unplayed expansion, and of course Terraforming Mars, because I bring that to every FLGS game night. And if I don't play it, someone usually plays my copy. Of those, after a bit of debate, we started off with a game of Zolkin. Uh, Zulkin the Mayan Calendar is actually the full name of the game, even though it's centered around an Aztec stunstone, but we'll forgive them for not knowing the difference between the two, since most of the world couldn't figure it out when they thought the world was going to end either. But anyway, bad picture on the box, bad theme, didn't tie it together well. But fantastic worker placement and removal game where you're rewarded for patience. Each turn, you either put workers on the board or you take them off. And it's never both. You can't put workers on and take them off. And it's only when they come off that they actually do anything for you. Now, the board is very cool. Nothing else like, out there like it. It's actually made up of a set of five gears. And each cog on the gears points to a different action spot. Each turn, the gear rotates. And the workers, of course, spin on the gears. Now, in general, the spots later on the gears are better. So you want to try to let your workers sit as long as possible to get the most out of them. But every turn, you either have to put some on or take some off. So you're going to be forced to take them off. It's a very unique mechanic I've never seen anywhere else. And it works really, really well. Now, Tribes and Prophecies is the name of the expansion, which I finally got off my pile of shame and got to use. Now, it adds two things to the game. The first are the tribes, and the second is the prophecies. So tribes... What that does is at the start of the game, each player just gets two random tribe tiles. They pick one, discard the other, and what they do is give every player a unique power. Now, these powers make the game much more asymmetric, so everyone's going to have something different. And I got to say, when you first read these powers, you're like, whoa, that's overpowered. And then you read your other one, like, oh, that's overpowered. And then you see what the opponent picked, you're like, oh, that's overpowered. Then you realize they're all overpowered, so... 
due to that, they're actually rather balanced. But man, like they're big abilities. Like if you played Zulkin before, one lets you pass instead of either putting your workers out or taking them away. That's just huge. You just can just let your guys ride and you get two corn for doing it. It's crazy. There's another one where they're these big fat Mayans and you get all your workers at once at the start of the game, but they all take extra corn because they're big fat Mayans and they eat a lot. So you end up with way more workers than anyone else in the game at the start of the game, but they want to eat a lot. Like it's just huge. It's neat. Now, the second part, though, is the prophecies part. Now, this one really changes the feel of the game. There's a new prophecy board, and on it, you draw and place three random prophecy tiles out of a significant stack. Each of these are horrible things that are going to happen later in the game. A disaster is going to happen each quarter of the game except the first, and you play through three quarter, or four quarters. Each of these forces you to spend more corn on one thing. And overall, they're all pretty horrible. But then there's an upside. The players who are able to mitigate this disaster and still manage to flourish in the area the disaster is happening gets bonus points, and potentially a ton of them. Now, the expansion also adds the ability to play with five players instead of four. Uh, this adds a new quick action that doesn't require you to place a worker on a gear. I got to admit, we didn't try this part because we just played with four players. Now, overall, Tribes and Prophecies, I like it. Tribes was the better half of the expansion. Uh, I'm going to use Tribes from now on. I love asymmetric powers in a game, so they'll be great. New powers is cool. Prophecies, I don't know. Like, Zolkin is a very tight, unforgiving game. It's all about the corn, and you never have enough. By putting Prophecies in and putting something in every quarter that costs more corn makes the game even more unforgiving. Now, I liked it, but I can see how not everyone will enjoy that. Well, knowing you guys, I can't say I'm surprised to hear you like the tribes. Well-designed player asymmetry is definitely oh, yeah. a feature that both you and D tend to enjoy in games. Uh, I have to say, though, I really don't know much about Zolkin, and as one of those heavier ones, it's not something that usually comes down comes uh, comes out when I'm down for a party. So uh, I haven't uh, haven't got any experience on that one. Oh, it's it's one you should try. Uh, it is a fantastic game, and the heaviness comes from the decisions, not the complexity of the game mechanics. So it's not a Terra Mystica, because Terra Mystica, the, well, there are a lot of decisions. It's trying to teach someone the eight different actions, or even Race for the Galaxy, right? Trying to teach all those different things and how they interact. But then the... in uh, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> But the example, I don't even know. I totally lost where I was going with that. We'll, we'll just cut part of that at the part, or I could just... <laughs> I don't even know where I was going. There was something with Race for the Galaxy I was about to say, and it just, woo, out of my head. <laughs> I have no clue. All right. Anyway, so Zolkin is one you should try. It's it's a fantastic game. I got to say the heaviness comes from difficult decisions, not the complexity of the game mechanics, which is a nice thing. So there's not a lot of learning to play the game. It's more figuring out what to do on your turn and the AP that comes with that. It's not just a ton of little things you need to learn. Plus, I gotta say, I'm still looking for challengers. That Zolkin is the one game in my collection so far I am 100% undefeated in. And I can't believe it after Saturday. Halfway through that game, I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna win this. I don't even know how I pulled it off. I managed to win that game, and I still have no idea well how. Now, I think I mentioned on the show before, Sean has a superpower that often the first time he tries something, he does ridiculously good for no good reason. Like video games, we used to see it, but even, I don't know, anything, dexterity games, whatever we played, the first time we play, he'd destroy us. And then every game after that, it was he was on par with us. So maybe your superpower of winning the first time you play can end my streak in Zulkin. Hashtag friendship goals. There we go. <laughs> uh, so first on my table... The kids and I made another run at the monster, monster Box of Monsters, and again, it was close. Now, I'm learning that there seems to be a tipping point, and when you hit that, if you haven't made it far enough already and achieved a certain uh, amount of progress into the game, you're pretty much done. Um, I'm working on how I can help guide the group strategy to maximize our chances and help help the kids sort of uh, make the right choices in in, in building their decks. Uh, but even in defeat, we still had fun. Uh, the kids aren't angry yet that we can't win. And it still felt like we achieved something even in defeat. 
No, that's good. It's good to see the kids aren't getting frustrated. Like, I can see my girls giving up after about two, three failures in a row in a game. Uh, we don't tend to play a lot of co-op games in a row. But the part that worried me is the part you said about the tipping point. Like, it almost seems like there should be some extra end game condition so that you don't waste time finishing off a game you can't possibly win. Well, in, in this case, actually, you're not, unfortunately, you're not wasting much time. Uh, huh. So, much like every other uh, every other box or game of uh, Hogwarts, there are three location cards, um, and the location cards dictate uh, how much you know how what what the villains are doing to you mm. and how much and when the when the villains take that location card, it's gone and there's no way to get it back, and mm. the next one has some something else on it, and and again they have to so they have to get through all three of those. Now the first location. Uh, every turn, you take one Dark Arts card and play that. But as soon as you get to the second location, you're taking two Dark Arts cards. And in the third location, you're taking three Whoa. Dark Arts cards every turn. Every turn? And because we're, you know, we're done the first box and into this expansion, there are a, num a good number of cards where when you draw a card, they tell you to draw another one. Ooh. So... When you're drawing three Dark Arts cards, there are times when you could be pulling six or even seven Dark Arts cards. And that so, makes me wonder if so there's the a rule. Really? I mean, that, and that's, that's where the acceleration comes in. So if, I've gotten, if we've gotten five villains out of the way by the time we lose the first location, we still have a chance. But if we've only taken three villains out and we lose that first location, it's going to... I mean, the, the acceleration, once, once you've lost that first location is pretty dramatic and that that's the tipping point i'm finding is when you've lost that first location the the bad guys really start hurting you fast it almost makes me wonder if there's a rule hidden in there that says at most you draw one extra dark arts cards even if there's multiple sources that say draw extra dark arts cards yeah, it might that be seems like the kind of rule Arata. that would be in there yeah well, i wonder I, I i haven't actually dug in for a rat on this game so maybe that's uh, maybe that's something i should check for an faq on uh, it's the kind of rule i've seen in other games right like you can only re-roll a die once right like that type of rule where it's you can only draw one extra card once you don't just keep drawing extras right. but you never know it's a deck builder right yeah. could just be like any other deck builder like ascension where you can cycle your whole deck if you happen to do it the right way yeah. so it could go either way so yeah we've gotten we've gotten close um so it's just and i and i think i you know I, i'm still feeling like it's doable so no good we'll see I wonder if the other books are going to be harder or easier, if this is going to be like the last one where it spikes at the beginning and then it's too easy at the end. Yeah, no, it's going to be hard. It's hard to say because I, I don't, I, you know, we haven't, I've been good. I haven't opened yeah. them, so I don't know <laughs> what else they're going to bring out. So back to my events, my games, I, I played, the other two expansions I played on Saturday were both for Villages of Valeria. Uh, it's the two small card pack expansions that had, I don't even remember how many, 12 cards each pack, I think. Uh, the first was Monuments, and the other is Guild Halls. So I'm interested to hear about this one after enjoying Card Kingdom so much at the last party. Uh, you can check out the unboxing video for both of these on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash tabletopbellhop. Now, well, Villages of Valeria is obviously in the same universe as Valeria Card Kingdoms. Uh, it's got the same awesome art. It's very much a standalone game. This is actually like a much smaller, small box game, smaller uh, tableau, smaller components, all just cards, uh, no resource tracking or anything like that. Uh, you do have some money tokens. That's about it. Uh, this is a tableau building game that to me feels like a light race for the galaxy with a fantasy theme. So, this will sound familiar to you as we've been playing so much. Each round, the lead player chooses an action and then carries it out. And then everyone else follows by doing the same action. Now, the person who picked it gets a slightly better version of that action. Um, the actions include developing resources, using those resources, and interestingly, the resources of other players to build village cards, recruiting heroes to live in your village, taxing to get more money in order to recruit and build, and harvesting to get more cards. Now, harvesting is like almost right out of Race for the Galaxy. The really neat part in this game that I don't even think I mentioned on the blog post is the way drawing and discarding works is you have a market of five buildings up and five heroes, and you have your deck of cards. Anytime you're drawing, you can take any of the face-up cards or from the random deck. The cool part is when you discard, you have to discard your cards on top of one of those piles. 
So it's a really neat mechanic. There's no discard pile. You're always covering up cards in the market when you're discarding. I've never seen that in any other game, and I really like it. Now, the expansions. Monuments adds a set of eight monument cards to the game. Five of those start out in the common market. So now your markets, your building cards, your heroes, and your monuments. Uh, when you recruit a hero, you can start work on a monument. Uh, these cards take a lot of work to build, but are worth more points than anything else in the game. Uh, this pack also has four new adventurers that just get tossed in mixed with the rest of the adventurers. Now, Guild Hall also adds four more adventurers, just mix them in. The also adds four new events, which is something that was initially added by a different small pack expansion called events, which I don't actually own. Now, thankfully, you don't need to own events to use these. And the way events work is they're mixed in with the building deck. And whenever you would draw a card and you get an event, you read it off and do what it says. Uh, we noticed it was half positive events, half negative events. Now, the thing that's supposed to be the big deal in the Guild Hall set are the Guild Hall cards. Uh, there's only four of them, surprisingly, for naming the module or naming the expansion after them. Uh, these are, look like normal building cards, but what they add is most style endgame scoring, where players get points for having the most of the type of building, or the most fighters, or the most thieves. Now, overall, I liked both these expansions. Uh, Monuments adds a Seven Wonders kind of feel with building the wonder, building your monument, uh, but did change up how the game feels, because every player spent time and picking monuments and working on them, which detracted from the rest of the game. Uh, the events in Guildhall seem really awesome, but it seems like you kind of need that expansion pack because you put in four random events, and well, it only comes with four events. So I have a feeling that one's going to get tired pretty quick because you're going to know which four events are going to come up every game. Uh, the rest of the stuff, though, was just adds more to the original game. Mix it in. So that was cool. Uh, I got to say, overall, for how cheap these packs are, I recommend picking them up. Well, it's hard to blame them for making expansions that make you want to buy more expansions. <laughs> uh, Guild Halls does seem a little bit limited, even even in, in that way, though. So, you know. Yeah, I, I wasn't overly impressed with... I don't know, it's so weird to take that expansion and split it into four different things, and eight of the cards are just more of stuff you already owned. Yeah. No, absolutely. But, uh, no, it definitely sounds like a, a solid game. Um, do, do you think you're going to keep that monument uh, in it, or is that one that might get put aside? Well, I want to play with it some more and see if a player can ignore it and still play, like, have a valid chance of winning. Okay. So next up for my family was more DC Heroes. Uh, but we've uh, we, we tried one of the expansions. We've now got the Crisis uh, mm. game. Now, the one thing I really like about this is it takes it and becomes a full co-op game. So now cool. it's just players against the game. There is no scoring at the end, pure co-op. Uh, and so that was great. What you do is you take your main deck and you build a timer. So you've only got 100 cards in that main deck. If you can't draw from the main deck, game's over. Mm. Uh, now, you also have to defeat not only the supervillains that you always have in the main game, but you've now got crisis events as well. Uh, and interestingly, you can't defeat a crisis event if there's a villain on the table. You can't defeat the supervillain until the crisis event is gone. So it's tricky. I mean, huh. it's it's there's a lot of moving pieces. And I have to say, the kids are struggling a bit with this one uh, because you've really got to sort of finesse your, your deck engine as you're building it. Just buying the cards you can doesn't really work out uh, doesn't really work out that well because you've you've got a there's there's some mechanics in these crisis events that makes it really hard that if you're not focusing on how your deck is built and how you can cycle through uh mm. it's it's tough to do um so we were uh we were over two hours and just the two two out the two player game the first time through wow um, <laughs> and so it's it's been a it's been a bit of it was a bit of a slog um it's really hard but again i think i think if you and i were playing it we'd probably have a better chance um at winning it um mm. There, and there's there's an interesting strategy that, that we completely missed on the first time through. Uh, the first time through, we thought, oh, well, we should just get rid of these crisis events. Except there's actually a, 12 crisis events and 13 supervillains. Um, and the crisis events are hard enough that you really want to be able to defeat a crisis event and a villain on the same turn. Okay. 
Um, so it's it's mm. again, it it really adds the complexity. If we're going to a co-op game, um, it it upped it next level. It was fun. We enjoyed it, but it was one of those things where the kid the the kids were done the moment the game was over. Wow. It was like it was too much for them to to tr- even consider playing again. Mm. Overall, it sounds like a rather large step away from the the base game, the original game. It is, uh, but I think it's in a good way. It's it's one of these things where it's it's the same game, but they've given it a sort of a twist, so you can have a whole different game with almost the same cards. The only real difference is those crisis cards uh, that that add it and and turn it into a co op game. So I, it's as tough as it is. I think it's uh, I think it's a really good thing for the game. Oh, that's good to hear. Now I know this one's newer, right? Like this, this came out last couple of years, if not last year. I wonder if the difficulty is a case of it being created for people who've been playing along since the original came out. Like the original is probably about ten years old at this point. I think it's been out for a long time. Uh, like so, if you started from the beginning and been following along and buying every expansion, you would have evolved your strategies and learned things that worked and learned how things changed with the uh, with the expansion packs. I, I almost wonder if it's I, they I do jumped. Think that's certainly part of it. Uh, but I mean, at the same time, Crisis the comics you know, blew up the multiverse, right? That was the the whole point of Crisis was to destroy the multiverse and wipe the slate clean for DC Comics to start over again. And so I think Mm. there is a level of that. I mean, the Anti-Monitor is the final villain, right? He was the overarching uh, super baddie from back in the days of Crisis. Um, So I think there's there's sort of a level of both. Um, I definitely think that we, you know, as a family, haven't quite gotten there yet. You know, I pulled out a... I pulled out a combo uh, we were playing today uh, with on a snow day, and I, I you know, um, I, I was four cards away from cycling the entire deck I wow. built. Um, yeah. And I mean, we were normally we'd been pulling up you know thirty or thirteen, fourteen, fifteen power, and I dropped a thirty five power oh, uh, round. Uh, and the, the kids were completely blown away, and I'm like, okay, but you know, understand this is look at what I did and how I got yeah. there because this is the sort of thing we need to be building to. Like, these mm-hmm. are the kind of interactions in a deck that we need to be working towards in order to ever defeat Crisis. So, makes sense. Yeah. So for me, Sunday afternoon, uh, with my kids actually, we took the girls to Rose Gallery Comics. Now this is a local comic shop that gives out free comics for A's on report cards. Awesome thing. Thank you, Sean, for doing that. Another Sean. I told you I collect <laughs> Sean. Uh, after picking up comics, we headed to the Coffee Exchange, my favorite local coffee shop, so the girls could get some hot chocolate and read their comics. Now while the girls were reading, my wife and I got in another game of War Chest. Now, this time around, we randomized the armies. We didn't play with the starter rules. We just dealt four random units to each of us. And wow, did that change the game. Like, previously, we just played with the starter recommended starting armies. And it was a completely, well, mechanics were the same, but, like, played very different with different armies. I got to say, I'm really digging the mechanics in this game. It is really hard to decide if you should try to get all your unit chips in your bag right away, or if you want to try to keep your bag lean so the units you want come up more often. And I've also noticed, say, even more so than, say, the Duke, War Chest really rewards paying attention to your opponent and remembering what your opponent has put in their bag and what's come out and what hasn't. Now, at this point, we still only played uh, four games overall, but I do dig it with one complaint. The board is too big. Now, I realize this was mainly a problem on Sunday because we were trying to play on a coffee shop table, but there is no reason the two-player board needs to be so big. Like, it's your standard 2 by 6 fold-out game board. It's just as big as the Gloomhaven board, for example. And the two-player board could be half of that. Now, with how well ga- well made the game is, with these awesome poker-sized ch- chips and everything else like the amount of money they put into production quality even the box with the magnet on it it would have been nice to have two boards in there one for two player one for for four or have a double-sided board because i was looking at it and if i just didn't have to fold out the last two segments i would have a nice square board and yeah it might not be quite flat but i would have been perfectly happy with that like i've only played four times i'm seriously considering going on like arts cow or something and getting a neoprene map printed up with just a two-player size board on it um and then sliding that in my copy of war chest because that chest is rather deep and there was cardboard in there and once you pulled it out i should be able to fit another board in there 
Well, it's good to hear uh, it's still holding your interest. And I think we had some printing suggestions in episode 21 <laughs> that can help you with that neoprene mat. Check That's out the link true. in the show notes. <laughs> and now, finally, my gamer shame. Now, this was on Board Game Arena, which I don't usually focus on on these, uh, on these things because we do play a lot of games there. But it was actually my first ever play of Carcassonne, which most people just assume anyone who is a gamer has played. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I did open up the rules, but it was one of those busy days when I was you know, working on my laptop and had the game open on the side. And so while I glanced at them and sort of blindly said, oh, yeah, meeples, cards, area control, sure. I didn't actually pay attention, uh, and I got slain. Uh, now, after realizing my glaring naivete, I actually read the <laughs> rules the next time and made an, a, an admirable showing, and uh, I have been invited back to to uh, continue playing with uh, the, the lovely people who, who you know, maybe may be upset that they're not going to beat me quite as soundly as they <laughs> did that first time. But... Uh, yeah, so uh, I finally uh, made it over that uh, that one step. We chatted about it on Twitter, and and when I mentioned I hadn't played it before, Eric was just like, "What? I never even yeah. considered that." Uh, I'm like, "Well, yeah, but you know, Mo's been my gateway to gaming, so I'm more likely to have played, you know, Food Chain Magnet than Carcassonne." That's pretty true. Did you play two player or more? Uh, it was four four player. Four player, okay. Very different game if you play two player. Kind of like the way Tokaido is very different. Much more cutthroat two player. Right. But yeah, Carcassonne is is it's one of the big three, right? Like Catan, Ticket to Ride, Carcassonne are pretty much the big three. I don't think you played a full game of Ticket to Ride either. We played New York, but I don't think you played the we did, the full we did box. one we did one Ticket to Ride at your uh, at your place once. And that so was, yeah, yeah, so that you played it once. Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's not one of my favorite games, so that makes yeah. sense. Carcassonne was just in that period where we didn't hang out for a long time because you moved to Toronto and we were busy. And when I was into Carc, you weren't here. So yeah. that's how that got missed. I got to say, though, it's true. Like, people just assume you play Carcassonne. I know I have many, many, many times. Like, I was playing Carcassonne long before I tracked it on Board Game Geek, but it'd probably be up in the hundreds. Because this is one of those few games that both my mom and dad would play back in the day when I could get them to sit down and play with us, even if my mom would help you complete your cities. (laughs) It's also, here's a a unique tip, or tip, I guess not a tip, uh, uh, anecdote. The first ever game I downloaded when I got my Xbox online for the first time, I think this was like the Xbox One, like the first Xbox, was Carcassonne. It was the first game I bought on Xbox Live. So, yeah, I still dig it. I I like it. I got to admit, I don't play it often. Uh, I played it a lot, and it it doesn't feel old. It's still a fresh game. It's still well done. But just for the number of plays I played, I much prefer um, the one I really dig is Isle of Sky which is a very similar tile laying game with similar mechanics with roads and mountains and cities, but it's got some auction mechanics and some neater stuff going on. Okay. So what'd you think of Kirk? Like you played it besides not doing well the <laughs> first time. Well, after I got over the, Oh my God, I don't know what I'm doing here. Why, why did I sign up for this game? Uh, I think <laughs> it actually plays now that I, now that I get the game, it actually plays very well on BGA. Cool. Um, knowing, you know, the, there's a big number right up in the top corner, right where you're looking at, so you know how many tiles are left, and you're not going to get caught oh, nice. in that end game uh, scoring that D was talking about in in the chat there. Um, so that's handy, um, and it's it's really good about you know the only thing I don't like is it always presents you every option for where your meeple can go, mm-hmm. even if you can't put it there. And so oh, if that's... I'm if I'm playing quickly, I'll, I'll click and I'll, oh I want to I want to be in that field. Well, you can't do that. Oh well, great. Uh, but it's also really great because it's you know it's stopping you from ever placing tiles sure. wrong. And I'm sure in a game it's real easy to accidentally yeah. drop a tile somewhere, and you know four four turns later you realize oh that shouldn't have been able to go there. Well, who placed that there? And yeah, you know that's definitely happened over the years. Uh, so it prevents the it prevents any chance of extreme rules, which is nice. That is nice. So a week ago Monday, my home game group actually managed to get together. It's been a long time since I've had a Monday night game group. So that was cool. Actually, it's now been two weeks in a row. Preview to next week. Uh, we played two games. So the first thing we played was a medium-length game of Dinosaur Island. Now, our previous games of Dinosaur Island were plays using the short game objectives. And I'm sure you heard it on the show. I was bummed by this because I found the game far too short. I'm pleased to say the medium length objective fixed that problem. 
we played four player. We all seem to really enjoy it. Uh, the game's still fairly short. I think the full game was five or six turns, but at least it felt like we accomplished something. It was an engine building game and we built an engine. Our parks were doing their own things and everyone's strategies were evident and you could see what was working and what wasn't. Um, personally, I was trying to get as many dinos as possible as quickly as possible. So I stuck to herbivores because they require less DNA to grow. Um, Sean Hamilton, not Sean from Hamilton, was trying all big bad dinos worth lots of points and lots of threat uh d was doing something in between um mike was trying to do something where he was managing the hooligans really well with uh, with the the park security had um if you own dinosaur island this is this is my note on it and you haven't played it yet just swap to medium length like as soon as possible. Like maybe your first game try the the, the recommended thing but realize it's gonna be short but if you play worker placement games before and games where you're drafting things, just play the first game using the medium objectives. Um, I am actually, to be honest, surprised how much better the game was just by using those longer objectives. Yeah. I noticed some of the responses to your tweet mentioning that the game really wasn't worth it except at long length. So I, I hope you can get to try that final length and see if, yeah. you know, it really is, you know, okay, finally we get this game this mm -hmm. is the great game now that we play it at full length. Because uh, it does sound like, and, and Dee is saying, that Medium really is significantly better yes. than that short game. So Yeah, we still haven't tried the long version, but one interesting thing. Next week, I'm going to be talking about Totally Liquid, because I played it this Monday. The first thing in that instruction book, literally the first paragraph, addresses an issue with game length that the company has recognized. But we'll talk about that next Wednesday. Tune in here. <laughs> now, after Dinosaur Island, Sean asked to play Azul Stained Glass of Sintra. Uh, he's played the original game many times, but had yet had a chance to play the new version. So we set up a four-player game. I did a quick teach, and we were off. And I kind of alluded to this last week. Wow, is Sean, like, good at Sintra? My God. Uh, first ever time I've seen someone complete every single column at least once. He had so many of those nice looking halls in his bottom row, each one scoring him multiple times. Cause every time he finished the column, you get points for everything to the right of it. Oh, it was insane. Like it was crazy. The amount of points he was getting. Now I've noted this game just doesn't click for me, but man, it clicked for him. Like he destroyed both Deanna, I and Mike, all four, three of us. Like, I think he beat us all by over 40 points. I have a feeling if you added up our points, we might have reached him. I'm not sure. We didn't stand a chance. So Sean obviously enjoyed the game. Like he, he just like fish to water. I don't know. Like he just made sense to him. Uh, the rest of us also had fun. Um, it was Mike's first time playing. Uh, he did dig it as well. Uh, again, he seemed to th prefer the original. Uh, I got to admit, I'm getting a little frustrated constantly coming in last. So I'm, I'm starting to actually think I might watch a strategy video or something or just be like, Sean, teach me what you did because I just don't get it. Well, you know, if you need a teacher or a way to learn the game, I think we have an episode or two that could help <laughs> you out with that. Yeah, I got to start listening to my own advice. That's my <laughs> problem, right? Maybe that's an episode idea, right? Uh, where to learn board game strategies when you know the game but can't seem to win. That that that's, that might be a future topic at some point. Mm -hmm. But I don't like to do that normally. I like to explore the game myself. But like I said, Sintra, I'm, man, I'm getting sick of losing. I, and <laughs> losing bad. Like, I don't even come close. I don't know what it is. So Sean brought up Board Game Arena earlier. Uh, we both play a lot of games on Board Game Arena. Like, we basically kind of stopped talking about it here on the show because you don't need to hear, yes, we played another three rounds of uh, Seven Wonders, and, yeah, we finished another seven games at Takedo since the last time you were here. So that's the kind of thing that's going on, and we play a lot of Race for the Galaxy. But I did want to talk a bit about Race for the Galaxy because of the Brink of War expansion. Now, we've been playing a ton of Race for the Galaxy, and what I've been doing, just uh, Deanna, Sean, and I have been playing, is slowly adding in the expansions and adding in things like takeovers, which actually yet, I don't think we've yet to see someone take over another planet. But this past week, we finished our first game using Brink of War. And the reason that's notable is I've owned the Brink of War expansion for my physical copy since it came out. And that's like three, four, maybe even five years ago. And when I got it, Deanna and I tried it a couple times, 
But we found the addition of the prestige points and more so the special action selection card, the special extra, extra card that goes in your hand to pick from, just to be too much. Like even for me, who loves race, it was just too many things to track. Like you had to, you now have a player board in front of you and you had cubes to track stuff. And it, it's literally the first expansion that if I'm going to play race with people who don't know it well, I pull out. And even if I don't pull it out, I'll often say, you know what, just ignore all the cards with prestige points and don't we won't use these extra draft drafting cards. So I thought at this point, you know what, it's on Board Game Arena. Board Game Arena is going to track all the stuff for us. I think it's time to figure out this expansion and how these new mechanics work. It seemed like a good way to do it. And I got to say, it's at least for me, seems to have helped. It seems to have worked. Well, <laughs> one thing I find, despite its rather prominent place right up on that top bar, uh, I tend to focus so much on my cards that I've been skipping checking the victory conditions and oh, playing yeah. for victory conditions. Uh, and I know that's hurting my uh, my scoring endgame. I, I did rather embarrassingly poorly on that last game we finished. <laughs> Uh, but I think I'm, I'm I'm feeling better about the game we're in right now, so I think I've I moved on. I actually did use the special card. Yeah, uh, I saw that already. So I, I'm I'm hoping that I used it at the right time and that it's it's starting to all all sink in. I think the last game, I don't even know if we all used the card. I know I was at the point I'm like the game's going to end next round. I might as well use it, which I, yeah, obviously wasn't the uh, the effective use of the card. It was a I might as well. Yeah, for me it was uh, it was sort of like I know I've got it there, but. I'm not sure I understand it well enough, so yeah. I, I just kind of left it there. So, like, right now we're only on game two of using Brink of War, but I, I now get how most of it works. I got to admit, I haven't figured out strategy, like, should I be going for prestige points or not, but I at least get how they work. Yeah. And uh, the bonus cards, the big one, though, realizing how that works, because it's it's weird, right? For race, it doesn't fit with the rest. It's a once-a-game ability that lets you search the deck for a specific type of card, but the types of cards are really limited, what you can search for. Um, plus, there's the whole it adds stuff to regular actions and getting w what it adds to each one. Like how many, if you do it on Explore, it's like draw seven, keep three or something. I got to say, here's where Board Game Arena really helped um, seeing that those cards in use. And man, the other thing that's great for Board Game Arena is the fact it tracks everything. Because when you're playing the physical game with Brink of War, like Race of the Galaxy should just be a bunch of cards and victory point chips. Once you're at this point, you got victory point chips, you've got prestige point chips, you've got first scoring um, tiles, you've got most scoring tiles, you've got these individual player boards where you track how many rebel worlds you have, how many imperial worlds you have, your military strength, whether you can be attracted or not. Like, all of this is now in your play area. And I gotta admit, like, it's overwhelming. I love the game, but I'm just like, man, there's just too much stuff now. I just want to play cards. So it's awesome to have Board Game Arena track that for you. I, it's really nice, and it's just off to the right, and you can see how many cards everyone has in their tableau, how many points they have. I, I gotta say, Board Game Arena is getting a big thumbs up for this one. Yep. So the one thing BGA isn't good at, however, is speeding up the game. Yeah. If you have no option to do something during a phase, it still asks, do you want to do fill in the impossible thing here, and makes everyone wait until you've clicked on that. So yes. if I if I you know play the the one thing I have able to do in for an entire turn and the next two phases I don't have anything I can do and I go to work, you guys have to wait for me to get home mm -hmm. from work to click that. No, I'm not going to do anything button, uh, and yeah. that that I find really frustrating. No, I agree. When when you when you're sitting there going, oh, it's your turn. I, and then you're like, wait, what do I have to do? And it's like, please place a world. I'm like, I have no cards in my hand. Come on, game. It's the same thing in Takedo, right? We've complained about that before. Board Game yeah. Arena is just not smart. It's the, okay, my next move is to move to the the, the inn to get food. You could have moved me. Yep. Why yep. not? There's only one card left. Well, and I think they're trying to make it as board game as possible. So, you know, yes. they don't want to move a piece for you. And I, I get that, but... At the same time, I, I really wish they would just do it because I, I no, am playing I it as a video game. I know I'm playing it as a video game. Yeah. So, so that's it. A little longer than usual because we both got in a lot of games. Plus, we had an extra Sean's review in there. Uh, that's it for this past week. Now, taking our usual moment to look at the less shame more game a pile of shame count. Uh, this week, I did get three expansions off the pile. 
but I also received a prototype copy of the latest expansion for Builders of Blankenberg that I hadn't put on the list yet. So that's got to be added to the pile. So this week we are at a net loss of two. The loss pile being a good thing. of shame. All right. And that brings us down to 70 on the current pile of shame. So that was a lot of games this week. I saw the chat flying by there. Anything interesting going on in the chat? Happy Fun Time Live. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, we've got... Uh, and and she games was saying she loves the idea of crisis events in the in that DC. And I have That's to cool. say, I really do enjoy it. Uh, but again, it's just it really upped that difficulty level. I mentioned in the chat there, uh, there is a solo uh, version mm. of uh, Crisis. So I'm hoping I'm going to find some time without the kids around so that I can sit down, try the solo and see if I actually know how to beat it. Like if, if my game, if my deck building skills are enough to, to beat it or right. if it really is that crazy hard. I wonder, you were talking about that while you were talking about it with the crisis cards. I wonder if it's because you don't know them yet. So now that you've learned what the events are, you can kind of prepare for them. Well, so like, I need yeah. to build by this deck to beat this event. Well, except it is a randomized. Uh, it is a randomized. Oh, you don't go deck. through all of them always, every time. Yeah, so it's uh, it there's uh, de and depending on how many players there are, um, it's actually interesting. The more players there are, the less villains and events there are because huh. everything happens every turn. So oh, right. If you left, if if you had the same number for uh, with three players as with uh, two, it would be you'd be sm completely creamed i noticed uh deanna noted it took a long time to get zolkin explained i gotta admit yeah there's there that the the setup for the the new expansion we were playing with some new people who hadn't played before having to teach the rules uh plus we did have an issue where we had a, a gamer who was interfering with us trying to get the game set up and start playing which reminds me of that reddit question you sent me right it was a situation similar to that. Like we really wanted to try it five player, but we didn't want that particular fifth player in the group. So there was a, there was a bit of a, I, I don't know how to word it. Uh, people well, it's problem. difficult. I mean, when you, when you get to games of a certain level and I mean, especially at your FLGS, you know what your, what the various gamers are capable mm -hmm. of when it comes to games. And if you're trying to sit down and learn an already heavy game with some yes. new heavier features, you don't want the, you know, the, the, the gamers who just aren't ready for it. Yeah, very true. And then that's exactly what it was, right? It, it, it's a it's great guy, but not a hardcore gamer, not someone who's going to enjoy a heavy game and is going to ruin the experience for other players. Right. So we had to go through that. What was interesting is uh, my copy of Brass Lancashire got played, but not by me. <laughs> someone took it and they set up a game at a different table. They're like, oh, we, we broke into your copy. So <laughs> that's still on my pile of shame, though. Right. Yeah. No. I've I've seen. A, there's been a lot of chatter about brass lately on Reddit. Oh, it's uh, and and big. it's funny. As soon as Embers became available on Amazon, yeah, the chatter on Reddit went through the roof. Everyone oh, yeah. is saying, "Should I go out and get Zaya with Embers? Is it you know blah blah blah? Is it is it you know Embers? Do I do I does does Embers fix Zaya? Is was Zaya broken? Well, blah, blah, yeah. blah. It just goes on. It, there's so much chatter about it. Oh, it does. I don't know. Zaya was kind of broken. It could be broken if stuff came up randomly. Yeah. Uh, Poncho is asking, what game needs the WD-40? That is for my squeaky chair. That is what that is for. And my squeaky door. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Misdirected Mark joined Phil, Chris, Bob, and now Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, thank you, and good to see you on Discord. Duran Barnett, thank you. Joe Swick, thanks, Joe. Jeff Seuss, thank you. William Fisher, thanks. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas, thanks. And welcome to our latest patron, P.S. Goujon. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock the front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. And if you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletopbellhop. 
Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop Live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.